All right, so let's go ahead and get started. This is the recording for our exam one review. I made the mistake of not hitting the record button as I was walking through the review, so this is my follow-up. Uh, so let's talk about the exam. So with the exam, you're given a lot of information. I've got uh, an exam review posted to our Canvas site in the module right after chapter five. Uh, I've got a, an old exam posted. I've got some, uh, actually, I've got the roadmap out there. So let me show you what you're looking at, or rather what I'm looking at and what you should be looking at. So this is our roadmap for the exam. It details more or less everything you should know. Uh, so our exam is going to cover chapters one through four, and it'll only be focused on the stuff that you saw in the lecture videos. So if you didn't see the material in the lecture video, I don't consider it fair game, and you won't see it on the exam. The exam will be 25 questions multiple choice, very similar to the practice exams that you'll see on the Canvas site under the exam one module. Now, uh, before I go any further, I should say that there is a practice exam that I expect you to take before exam one. That way you'll know if you have any technical issues and I'm gonna give you 20, 20 points uh, when you complete it. So you need to complete that before exam one, uh, otherwise, if you come to me and say, hey, I didn't complete the practice exam and then tried to take the real exam and had technical issues, uh, well, I'd prefer not to be in that situation. So just take the, the Respondus Lockdown Browser Practice Exam and I'll give you 20 points and then uh, try and take the real exam. All right, so this exam, it covers everything from chapters one through four that I I touched on in class. Uh, so in chapter one, we have a lot of information on the asset classes, uh, breakdown of the difference between the Fed funds rate and LIBOR, uh, some of the various uh, characteristics of asset classes, how to write an IPS or a prospectus, and then also the uh, firm life cycle and the business cycle. Chapter two is primarily about how the markets work. So the primary versus secondary markets. So we talked about IPOs and how a firm goes public. Uh, we also talked about the secondary markets and as a result, talked about the NYSE and the NASDAQ. I introduced some recent trading innovations like high frequency trading, uh, algorithmic trading. Uh, and then we also wrapped up with me discussing margin, shorting, and the risks of international investment, which the big ones are political risk and currency risk or exchange rate risk. So yeah. uh, chapter three is primarily on orders and indexes. So that's where you got a lot of that, uh, a lot of those questions where I ask you to collect real world information from Morningstar, Finviz, Edgar, Yahoo Finance, et cetera. So you should know something about the data availability of each of those sites. Uh, I won't ask you to collect data directly from those sites, uh, nor will I ask you to use Excel on the exam, but you should know what is available on those sites based on the questions that I asked in the assignment and what I covered in the lecture videos. You should also know the breakdown between discount and full service brokers. Uh, basically, discount brokers, they offer you access to their trading platform and uh, they give you brokerage reports. You should also know something about the five types of orders, so limit buy, limit sell, market, stop loss, stop buy. Uh, so what are those orders? How do we use them? I'll talk about that a little later. And then finally, we have price weighted and valuated returns or uh, indexes. So I'll almost certainly ask you a question that requires you to calculate the, uh, say the value of a price weighted index or the return on a price weighted index or the return on a value weighted index. In chapter four, that's where we got into returns and we kind of started to touch on uh, a lot of stuff that is 
probably or hopefully a little more remedial uh, after you've taken 300. Uh, quite frankly, this is these first four chapters are a lot of remedial material just to make sure I know that everyone's on the same page. Uh, the real useful material comes at the start of next week in chapter five. Uh, so in ch chapter four, we covered EAR and APR. Uh, I touched on IRR uh, in, in a, a class and in your assignment, I asked you to calculate IRR. And then you should also know something about VAR, the sharp ratio, and then volatility and variance. So with that being said, oh, I will not ask you a question on risk aversion. It wasn't covered in chapter four, and I need to update that. Uh, so do not waste your time trying to find out anything about risk aversion. I will not ask you a question on that. Uh, so why don't I, I know I didn't get any questions when I was uh, first giving this uh, exam review. So I'll just jump in and talk about the questions that I, I discussed in the review. Uh, so this exam one review, oh, that should say without answers. Uh, I just worked the questions a little while ago. So let's start with number one. So you have $20,000 in a brokerage account. You want to buy as much as you can of Google stock, which trades at $400. Your maintenance margin is 40%. How many shares of Google can you buy? Well, the first thing that you need to realize is that $20,000, that's your own money. That's your equity. That's the amount that you put in. And if you borrow from your broker, you will be able to borrow to the point that your, your margin, your percentage of your own equity as a portion of total assets or portfolio value is 40%. So the first thing we need to know to solve this problem is we need to know how much you can borrow from your broker. And the way to determine that is by realizing that margin is just equity over total assets. It's just your own equity, what you put in, so AKA $20,000 divided by the total assets that you have uh, in, your, in your brokerage account. Next, to determine the, the maximum amount that you can, uh, the maximum value of your portfolio, we have the maintenance margin. I mean, this is as much as you can borrow. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug in the maintenance margin and your equity and solve for total assets. And when we do that, we find that your total assets or the total value in your brokerage account is $50,000. So this is the maximum amount that you can achieve if you take your 20,000 and borrow from your broker as much as you can. The maximum you're gonna be able to accumulate is $50,000 that you can then invest. Now, to determine the number of shares of Google you can buy, you're just gonna divide that $50,000 by the, the price per share, of $400, and that'll give you 125 shares. So that's the answer. All right, let's see. Yeah, let's try this one. I went over this one a few minutes ago. Uh, so you want to, you're currently analyzing the outstanding limit orders of Apple. Uh, you want to purchase 400 shares using a market order. What price will you pay for these shares? So you need to understand how to read this type, this material. I went over it in class, uh, but let's go over it again. So this first column, these are the outstanding bids of, for Apple stock. Uh, it essentially says that investors are submitting limit orders that have not been filled. No one's accepted their orders. No one's uh, said, I'm willing to sell my shares for the price that you're willing to pay. Now, these limit orders, they tell us the maximum amount that someone is willing to pay to buy a certain number of shares. So in this case, this 119.75, this tells us that that individual is willing to pay no more than 119.75 to buy 100 shares of Apple stock. The second column, the asks, these are the limit sell orders. So for example, uh, an, an individual or an investor that owns shares, they're willing to sell their shares, but only if that price that they're getting is above a, or equal to a certain price. So this ask, says this investor is willing to sell up to 50 shares 
for no less than $120.50. All right, so in this question, we're willing to buy 400 shares using a market order or a series of market orders, realistically. So the way market orders work, if it's a market buy order where you're telling your broker you want to buy 400 shares, what you're really telling them is find the 400 shares that cost the least and buy them on my behalf. So in this case, you're paying 119.80 for the lowest price 300 shares currently available, and then you're paying 119.84 for the next hundred uh, cheapest shares. So the answer here is E. I mean, you're going to pay this price for the first 300 and that price for the next uh, 100. All right, fair enough. Let's go to question six. So question six asks us to, uh, so you are calculating a real interest rate and you were just informed the rate on a one-year T-bill is 3.5%. Uh, you believe there will be a 2% change in the CPI. What is the real rate on your one-year T-bill? So the problem here is that every rate you're quoted in the real world, unless it says it's a real interest rate or it's adjusted for inflation, that's a nominal yield. It's not been adjusted for the uh, decrease in your purchasing power that comes with, from inflation. So the way we control for the decrease in your purchasing power from the start to the end of your investment in this one-year T-bill is by using this, the Fisher equation. And the Fisher equation says that one plus your real interest rate is equal to one plus your nominal interest rate, aka quoted interest rate, divided by one plus the inflation factor. And in this case, inflation is 2%. We're expected to be 2%. Now inflation, as you saw in the lecture video, that's just the change in the consumer price index. That's how we calculate it in the US. So realistically, what we're doing is we're taking a look at the level of the consumer price index at the start of a period, uh, looking at the level at the end of a period, and then using our return equation to calculate the percentage change in inflation. So in this question, we're not doing that. I've just given you the inflation, but all we need to do is just take one plus our nominal interest rate, divide by one plus our inflation factor, subtract the one that was on the left-hand side, and we get our real interest rate. So if you choose to invest in this T-bill, the actual increase in your purchasing power from the start of your investment period to the end of your investment period, so the end of the year is 1.47%. All right, now let's try an APR question. So here I get to, I, the first time I was uh, giving this review, I tried out some new technology and I think it worked well, but we're about to find out if it works well again. So I'm gonna move over to my uh, webcam, which I have jerry-rigged to some PVC pipe, and that way you can see my calculator. So, let's go through question seven. And question seven says, you're currently being offered a credit card with a 17% APR compounded monthly. What is the effective annual rate on this credit card? So we have 17% APR and we want to get the EAR. Now you could solve this using the EAR to APR or APR to EAR equations, but the easier way to do this, the faster way to do this as well, is to use EAR or the ICONV function. So here on your BA2 calculator, which you'll be able to use for the exam, uh, you will need to go to second and then hit the two button, which above it says ICONV. And there I've already entered this information, but let's say it was 5% and I wanted to change it. Uh, what I would do is I would hit our interest rate, which in this equate, this question is 17%. And then to lock it in, I'm going to hit enter. So notice here when you hit enter, 
you'll see the equal sign appear next to the NOM. That means you've locked it in. You need to make sure you have the equal sign. So next, I'm going to hit the up arrow. And uh, now to set your compounding periods per year, which is what this C divided by Y is, you need to enter in uh, the number of times that this uh, APR will compound during the year. So if it's a monthly interest rate, you're putting in 12 here. If it's a daily interest rate, you're putting in 365. So we have a 17% APR compounding monthly. So I'm going to put in 12 and then lock that in by hitting the enter button. So again, notice the equal sign. Finally, I'm going to go up to the EFF and I'm going to hit compute, this top left button here. And the answer was already there, so it didn't change, but uh, that's how you get your effective annual rate. In this case, our effective annual rate is 18.39%. Uh, so obviously the, EA, the EAR is greater than the APR. The reason it's greater than the APR is because the APR, it's a simple interest rate. You're not taking into account compound interest. With the EAR, you are taking into account compound interest, and that interest is earning interest on itself. So that additional 1.39%, I mean, that is interest on interest during the year. So there we go. The answer in this case is going to be, well, it's D, but let me share the screen. There we go. Maybe. I believe I'm sharing the screen. Maybe not. Well, I hope I'm screen sharing. Uh, so the answer is D. Okay, next, you own a bond which has an, uh, you own a bond which has a two basis point daily interest rate and you're assuming daily compounding. What is the EAR? So here, this would be one of those questions where you use the time value of money formula. Uh, you should just know it by now. That's why I'm, I'm not even gonna uh, bother to write it out. Just says the present value, the future value is equal to the present value times the quantity of one plus your return to the power of t. Well, your return here is two basis points. And to calculate your EAR, uh, so the effective annual rate here, all you're going to do is take one plus that two basis point uh, daily interest rate and take that to the power of 365 and subtract one. So here, 1.0002 to the power of 365 minus 1, and I'm getting 7.57%. And I need to correct my grammar on these things. OK, the next question to go over is question 10. You're currently attempting to identify with some degree of certainty the lowest return your portfolio will suffer over the next year. Uh, one of the best statistics which will allow us to determine a lower bound on our return would be, uh, so a lot of these are useful statistics, but not for determining a lower bound. So skewness tells us how skewed our distribution is. Uh, kurtosis tells us how fat the tails of our distribution of our return. Uh, our PE ratio tells us valuation, sharp ratio tells us risk adjusted return, but only the value at risk actually tells us the lower bound that we could expect if uh, to have. And what, that, what the value at risk really says is that uh, if it's a VAR of 0.01, then 1% of the observations 
of are likely to come below that VAR. It's, a, it's basically a lower bound, a lower threshold. With the VAR of 0.05, that means that 5% of the observations in the future will come below that bound, and 95 will be above that bound. All right, next, you're currently analyzing a, a security which is comprised of a portfolio of other assets. The security has a weighted maturity of 45 days and currently offers a low 2.5% annualized return. Uh, the security is most likely a, well, here we have a portfolio of assets, so it's gonna be some kind of managed fund, and it has a weighted maturity of 45 days. This means that it's going to be in the money market. Uh, anything that has a maturity of less than a year is going to be in the money market. And correspondingly, assets in the money market have very low returns. So the correct answer here is a money market mutual fund. These money market mutual funds hold a collection of assets like CDs, T-bills, commercial paper, which is just the short-term debt of companies like Berkshire Hathaway and Apple. Uh, any other short-term asset could be in here, uh, repos, for example. So correct answer is C. Right, next, we have a historical daily standard deviation question. And so uh, this daily standard deviation is 0.043. What is the annualized standard deviation? So here, it's a classic scale up question. So the way we solve something like this is by recognizing that we always scale up by the square root of the number of periods over which we're scaling up. So if we're scaling up from monthly to annual, we're gonna take the, the monthly volatility or monthly standard deviation times the square root of 12 because we're scaling up over 12 months from a monthly standard deviation. Here, however, it's a bit trickier because there are, I mean, the classic mistake is for people to plug in 365 here or the square root of 365. That's not the right answer. If you try to do that on the exam, you're gonna miss it. Uh, the reason the correct answer here is daily volatility times the square root of 252 is because there are 252 trading days during the year. So, I mean, obviously every year has 365 days, but you have weekends when the market isn't open and you also have market holidays like Christmas and New Year's. So in that case, the market is closed. And so if you wanna go from a daily return to an annual return, you need to have that reflected in the number of days over which you can actually have a return. So that's 252. So our annual volatility is just our daily volatility times the square root of the number of trading days during the year. And that'll get us 0.6842, or otherwise known as E. All right. Yes. Uh, so down here, I do have a question on the value of an, or the return on an index. So a stock exchange has two stocks. The stocks have the prices below. If this is a price weighted index, what is the change in the value of the index over year one? All right, so you have these two securities in the index and we have their prices at two different periods. Now, notice I say that there, this is a price weighted index. There are two types of indexes in the market. We have price weighted and value weighted. Value-weighted means that you sum up the total market cap of the securities in the index and then compare the change in that total market cap over the period. Price-weighted indexes are a lot more simple. All we're doing is just calculating the average price of the securities on that index. So what this means is that the index value at time period one is just the sum of the prices of the stocks at time period one. So we have two stocks, one with a share price of 25, the other with a share price of 50, and there's two of them. So we're dividing by two and getting the average share price of 37.5. That's our index value at time period one. Our index value at time period two is just our price of A plus our price of B, 30 and 55, divided by two, 
and that'll get us an average share price of 42.5. And then to calculate the return on the index, all we're doing is just using our basic return formula. The thing that I said, if you don't know how to do it on the exam, you're gonna fail the exam. Uh, yeah, so all we're doing is just taking the price at the end minus the price at the beginning, all divided by the price at the beginning. And that'll get us our 13.33%. And we're done. QED. All right. I think that is almost all of them. I did, uh, let, let's go over this question 19. So we have three securities with the following information. Uh, we have some excess returns on these three stocks, and we have some volatility numbers on these three stocks. Our goal is to select only the stock with the highest Sharpe ratio, which stock should we select? Well, the Sharpe ratio is the excess return divided by the standard deviation of the stock. Or if you wanna put it, uh, break it down a little more, it's your expected return on the stock minus the risk-free rate, which is always the yield on a treasury security, divided by the standard deviation or volatility of the stock. So here, what we need to do is we need to divide the excess return on stock A by our volatility on stock A. And so when we do that, it's 8.5% divided by 0.2545. That'll get us a return uh, or a sharp ratio of 0.334. Next, our sharp ratio of stock B is just the excess return divided by the volatility. So our sharp ratio is 0 0.3603. Sharp ratio of stock C is just 0 0.1067. So it had the highest return but it also had the highest volatility and its sharp ratio is 0.3248. Now, if we're determining which stock should we select, well, the answer is always gonna be the stock with the highest sharp ratio. And that means this stock, stock B. Uh, the reason we select it is because it's, it's sharp ratio, that's the risk adjusted return. It's the highest return for the amount of risk that you're taking. Uh, although stock C offers a higher return, you have to accept the higher risk of that stock. And so, you know, if we wanted to, realistically, what we could do is we could buy shares of stock B, we could lever up by borrowing money from our broker, and yes, we could achieve a risk of this, but our return on stock B would be higher if we levered up to the point that our risk was equal to that of stock C. So what I'm trying to get at here is you can always increase your return by levering up, but the important thing is to have a high risk adjusted return. And so that's why the answer here is stock B. All right, so with that, I think I'll wrap up. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And uh, I, I suppose that's all I've got. So thank you very much.